chapter so far. I hope you guys are getting something out of the class. I know I am. If you guys are taking the time to do the reflections, uh, like I said, if, even if you don't have time, to, like write it down. I'm not saying this to get you guys to be lazy, but even if you, what happened to your hand? Mm, My bad. Like wow. I like the cat stuff. <laughs> I don't mean to call you out, but can you show your cast to everybody? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a pretty cool cast. But so anyway, I hope you guys are learning something out of it. Uh, you know, take advantage of these classes. Really, I mean, they're intended to really help you out spiritually, intellectually, um, and it helps for you to understand your the Bible a lot better. I mean. For me, organizing this class has really, really helped me out in it and gain a better understanding of, of Matthew. Just the chapters that we were reviewing, take time to really, really, I mean, challenge yourself in it and see how much you learn. It's amazing. Uh, let's get into it. Which chapter are we looking at? How many of you guys did you read? <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> she's never here, correct? She's never here, but she's like doing the classes. Like doing everything. And then, you know, um, but come to class. <laughs> and then I have to say, um, whatever. I need a random volunteer. I don't know. Okay, it was just random. I don't know what just happened. I'm going to pick on you all day long. Alright, what was the reading? Matthew 11. Matthew? Okay, hold it with both hands. Okay. Uh, just, um, we're going to do part of the first section. I'll, get it, I'll try to finish it. It's very long. And then next week is just four verses. So I'm like, that doesn't, you know, the numbers are not working out. Um, so we're not going to do the whole thing today. Uh, but we're going to look at it. Uh, just do it until, until this. No, it's not bad. Okay. I'll hold it with this one. Real loud and, you know. Uh, when Jesus had finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he went out to teach and preach in towns throughout the region. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about, the, heard about all the things that the Messiah was doing. He, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, Go back to John, tell him what you've heard and seen, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, and the deaf ear, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the, the good news is being preached to the poor. Uh, and tell, them, tell him, God blesses those who do not turn away from, turn away because of me. Yeah, just read that. Um, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking about him to the crowd. What kind of man did you go into the world? go into the wilderness to see. Was he a weak reed, swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No people with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes, and he is more than a prophet. John is a man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, look, I am sending you a messenger ahead of you. Very good. Thank you. God, that's something. All right. Um, first, can I get uh, a little summary of uh, chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10? Quick summary. Not everything. Just quick summary. Please. Okay. Can we start our talking about the disciples? Yeah. Um, who they are. What's the major theme of Matthew 10? To me, it was just like um, that you're going to be persecuted in my name. Right, right. What else? Uh, but. 
instructions. Instructions to do what? To preach the word of God. To preach the word of God. That's the major thing with time, right? You guys are going into the world, you're gonna be persecuted, you're gonna like all these things are gonna happen for you, you go out and teach. So that's kind of Matthew chapter ten as a summary. What is uh like the verses that we read? What's the summary of this? Quick summary. So what happens? He finished teaching them, and then what happens? Quick summary. Hmm? Yeah. He goes out to preach to the nearby areas. Very good. And then what happens? John the Baptist, who is in uh, prison, he asks his followers to go and check, or ask Jesus if he's really the Messiah. Very good. And that's kind of the discussion that we're going to have. So here in chapter 10, he tells his disciples, hey, go out into the world and preach the word of God. And when you preach the word of God, all of these things are going to happen to you. He's explaining to them in that, that entire chapter is just like what they should expect to be his disciples. What, what's in store for them. Now, the first thing we encounter in chapter 11 is, and then Christ goes into the world to teach. He tells his disciples, go out into the world and teach. And then after he instructs them, what's the first thing he does? He goes out and teaches. What's, what do you think about that? What do you think this is signifying? What should we take away from this? Hmm? Give me my example. This is why Christ is like no other, right? Like a lot of teachers, they sit down and they tell you like, like how we do, right? We like don't lie, don't cheat, don't do this, don't do that, right? We talk about this every single time, but then we go into the world and we do the exact same things we said not to, not to do, right? Christ teaches by example. He doesn't even really like talk about it. He doesn't say like. I'm going to go and teach now, you know, and let none of this stuff, like he actually does it, right? So I think this is the first thing I need to take away is he models what it means to be a true teacher. He, model, he models a true teacher. How? What? <laughs> he models what a true teacher should be. This is what it is. He models what a true teacher should be. So he's showing us by example. Um, the fact that he's telling them, like, go and teach, go and do this, go and do this. And then he goes into the world and he begins to teach. He doesn't think he's above his lessons. This is a real problem, especially, you know, those people who are beginning to serve. We think we're above the law that we create for ourselves. And this is a huge problem, right? So we, t we tend to talk about the importance of taking heed and the importance of following instructions. But yet, hello. Welcome, new member. <laughs> Have a seat. Every time he comes, we ask him, "Are you a new member?" <laughs> I've been home for the past two years. <laughs> um, so it's important to, to understand, regardless of what position we hold within the church, we're not above anything else, and we are still. Um, we still have to follow the rules that we set, you know? Um, and, and that goes within the Bible. Like, we're not exempt from things like going to the church. Like, we talk about, for example, going to the church. But for some reason, when it comes to us and our personal life, we justify the days that we don't go to the church. It's okay I didn't go to the church today because I was doing so and so. But when we talk to other people in the world, uh, we ask them, hey, have you been to the church? And they say, no, like, no, never miss church. Do you see? Like... We have to lead by example on ourselves, not just for other people, but for ourselves. The rules actually matter what we teach, so I think that's a huge takeaway. When we serve in the church, we get recognized as church people. Now, here's what I want to say about this. Imagine, vision. When you're walking out and you see somebody smoking, right? What do you think to yourself? Somebody smoking, right? And then imagine if like a monk is like hitting the J right quick, you know? What do you think to yourself? A monk is hitting the J. And when you have like a, a conversation with your friends, you're going to say, some monk was smoking. So that, they're symbolizing the minute, like they go out and they do whatever, they're symbolizing the church. Right? And the same thing, this is uniform. You're not allowed to uniform. When you walk around, you're wearing a uniform. People don't recognize you as you. They recognize you as a person from church. So when people talk, they look like some guy from church did this. You know, some gal from church did this. And you get recognized as that person from church, especially the more you serve. The reason why I'm talking about this is most of us are aware of the group YOTC. We serve within YOTC. Um, 
reputation, right? So like whenever we get together, and it's good. But how we act and how we behave, believe it or not, is attached with YOTC. We may not know, notice it, especially those of us who are beginning to serve more and more and our faces are being attached with YOTC. Whenever we do certain things, we've got to start recognizing we're not just holding our name, we're holding the name of YOTC. We're holding the name of, of a church, we're holding the name of, of Christ, right? So when people who don't know anything about the church interact with us, the first thing they're going to say is, you know, I hang around with church people and they act this way. If we act positively, they will say they act great, like beautifully. If a person encounters a monk who holds the door for them, they'll be like, some monk held the door for me. And if it happens again, they'll be like, monks hold doors all the time. I've seen them, right? So their, their attachment is not with the person. It's with a monk. Whenever they see a monk, they'll be like, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, do it, do it, do it. Because they're going to get a, 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 like, attached to that action, right? And the more we, being already attached with being church folks, if we start doing good things, people will be like, you know what? Those church people over there, they're always good. If we do bad, they're going to be like, those church folks, they're annoying. They're horrible. They do this, they do that. So we have to start thinking about the fact that things that we do not only affect uh, affects us, it affects the church, it affects the community, it affects everybody. It affects Christ and how Christ, Christ is being looked at. People have negative attitude about not Christ, but those who say follow Christ. If you, like I'm reading a book right now, I'm not going to tell you the title, but it's, it's like bashing Christianity, like really, really bad. The author is a bishop, but we're not even going to talk about that. <laughs> We're not even going to get into that. But he's bashing, I mean, like, just the, the core of Christianity. And his reason for his anger in a lot of the things is because of how people behave within the church. It's not against Christ, but this guy is, like, you know, against the, t the core values of Christianity. But he is against the people who say they believe him and they follow him, but they don't exemplify that. Yeah. Is he a revisionist? Um, I, I, yeah, essentially, right? Because, I mean, he's doubting things like the resurrection, the virgin birth, and stuff like that. But he's a bishop, still. That's... No. <laughs> not, not at all. Episcopal, Episcopal. That's why I don't want to say it. <laughs> We're going to edit that part out. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I was going to try again. Um, yeah. That's your disappointment. <laughs> Episcopal. <laughs> Get that one. Gotcha. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, that's the first takeaway. The second thing is, now as you said, so John the Baptist asks his disciples, go and ask Christ if he is the Messiah. Wait a second. What's happening? Who's saying this? John the Baptist is asking whom? 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 <laughs> his disciples to do what? To ask if he's the Christ. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that cr like? Let me back up. John the Baptist is the same like John, <laughs> who earlier in Matthew chapter three is like, I'm not worthy to to even untie his shoes. He's talking about somebody greater than I am is going to come. And he's going to, I baptize you in water. He's going to baptize you in water or fire. So he's talking about Christ knowing who he is. And now he's like, go to Christ and ask if he's the Messiah. That makes no sense. Because earlier in the chapters, in Matthew chapter 3, when you guys reviewed it without my, you should have learned, that he, <laughs> he, was, very, he was an advocate. He was the voice of of who Christ was going to be. He was the one um, preparing the way for Christ to come, as, as the prophecies tell us. So why would John at this moment ask if Christ is the Messiah or not, right? There's a reason why he does this. He's not doing it for himself because he already knows this. And, and we, we see in the Bible that he's time and time again has already alluded to the fact that he knows who Christ is. Uh, in Matthew chapter 3, he says, um, But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, like I said. And later on, he recognizes the one who is greater than him, saying, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, in Matthew chapter 3, 14. So, here he says, there is somebody greater than I am. And then when John the Baptist 
baptizes people. So when Christ came to be baptized, he said, no, 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 no. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. So he recognizes that Christ is the one who's great. But then in John chapter 1, in a different gospel, um, he explicitly says, then uh, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the Son of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. And I mean, that is a loaded uh, verse. I mean, there's a lot going on within that verse I'm not going to get into. Um, but we'll just think about this verse. So here, clearly John knows who Christ is. So the question remains, why would he send his disciples to Christ to ask if he's the Messiah or not? Well, the answer is, is clear. It's not, he's not asking for himself. He's asking for his disciples. His disciples were doubting whether or not this was the true Messiah that had been told about in the prophecies. So he wanted the, the, the disciples to go and check for themselves to see if they have any doubts remaining and they need to clear this out for themselves. This is what we need to take away for our spiritual needs. The church has a lot of teachings, right? And we've been kind of trained to think scientifically and like in a very, you know, like to question everything, which is good. But when we're dealing with the church and the teaching of the Bible, we're dealing with mystical and spiritual occurrences. So it's natural for the two worlds to kind of not go together and to mix up. So it's natural to have doubts if we're sincere. So it's important to stop and say, do I really believe this stuff that the church teaches? Especially if you grew up in the church. Right? If you grew up in the church, it's normal. Like you go to church, pray, God and the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God I made, right? We just had a whole bunch of stuff just within the, the crossing. We said a whole bunch of stuff. That's a loaded statement. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe God is one and three, three and one? Do we really believe that God who is divine, who is eternal, came, became man, and he died. Do we really believe that? It doesn't have to make sense, but do, do we believe it, right? Do we believe he was born from a virgin? I mean, this is our, like, our, our faith. Do we believe the Bible is the word of God? And these are questions that we need to think about, because if we don't, we're not really, like, we're just going with the emotion. And the problem with that is, of course, we get tired of Christianity, we get bored of Christianity, we don't live the life, we, um, and, and, and that doubt kind of starts to kind of come into our day-to-day -day life and how we worship Him. And the fact that we see Christianity as this restraint that, that kind of holds us back from having fun. So one of two things will happen. We'll either, either throw it out completely right to you. We'll either um, completely throw it out and not believe it, or... We'll take parts of it, we'll take like, like a buffet. Like, uh, give me a little prayer here, not fasting, no, no, no. Give me a little, uh, a little like meditation here, you know? Like, give me a little Matthew, mm, I don't want any Old Testament stuff. And then like, so we start picking and choosing based on our needs just to be happy. So this is no longer a church, this is more of a meditation, uh, kind of, I don't know, like spiritual uplifting type of community service. Right? So the, the God wants 100% of you. He, he wants all of you, not part of you. So if we don't believe it, we have to kind of confront that. And that's okay to have doubts. But if you don't confront it like the disciples are doing, it's going to grow. And that doubt is going to keep growing until the point that it becomes very... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I was trying to think of a smart word. Until it destroys you. That's it. <laughs> Um, okay, so the crystal faith, however, is mystical and spiritual. That's your uh, uh, blank. And that it should feel this way, the creed. So how do we respond? You respond in one of two ways, and I'm sure like this is very broad, so you can keep you know, adding to the list. Number one is prayer. You've got to understand that God is the one who reveals mysteries to you. Um, it's not on our own understanding of how like God is that we'll understand it. Right? We have to ask God to really reveal who he is. I mean, that's what Abraham did, right? Abraham was very, very meek, and, and, and he wanted to know who his true creator was. He said, questioned it. 
It's good to question. I mean, we've been taught, don't question, just say I'm in, right? Say I'm in, but question. In a good way. Don't be just like... The difference between true, sincere questioning and bad questioning is the difference between, I think, Abraham and the Greek philosophers in the time of Christ. When Christ came, the Greek philosophers just couldn't believe of this thought of God becoming man and dying on a cross and being born of a virgin. It didn't make sense logically, right? And that's what Paul was talking to. So he said, no, this can't happen. And they kind of closed the door. And, and this, this is not doubt. This is, not, this is just not listening. And we, we're going to get into what it means not to listen. But the good questioning is, Abraham was in a family where pe people didn't believe in the God of Moses, right? They believed in, in different type of gods. He had to question that in order to leave, but he had that sincere questioning where he opened up his heart and allowed God to guide him. And if we do that, you will find Christ every single time. So that's the first thing is pray, seek God. I don't understand this. How did virgin birth, how is that possible, God? I don't understand it. I don't believe it. Help me have faith, right? It's okay to, to really be honest. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and number two, asking. So the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy, ask you, your fathers and they will tell you. It tells us that in the book of Job as well. So we have to be able to, to give time to learn as well, right? Um, it cracks me up in the world. Uh, like if you have a conversation with like your friends who, are, you know, who think they know a lot. They have so much to say about the Bible, but very few people read you know, people have opinions about the Bible. You ever notice? Like, you have a conversation. You know, I don't read the Bible because of, like, so whatever they say after that doesn't matter, right? You can't say something negative about the Bible saying that you never read it, right? Yeah. <laughs> One. So we have to take time to really, like, learn about our faith and to understand what our, our church uh, fathers teach. Most of the time, the problem is we don't even know what the church teaches on a subject. But we want to have an opinion about it. We want to have an opinion about it, right? Like, people have a lot to say about what the teaching of certain aspects is. For example, uh, let's take marriage, for example. People have their own philosophy about how marriage works. No, the, ch the church teaches us what marriage is, right? Uh, people want to have a philosophy about, like, um, like reading the Bible or just different things in general about our, our life and how we should live our life. The church has outlined the teachings about these different materials. We're not entitled to just have our own philosophy and, and, and mindset and speak on behalf of the church. We can't do that, right? Let's keep going. Um, so we need to, a time to really learn about what the church teaches, what the Bible teaches, and really understand those core values. Let me stop here and see if you guys have questions. Okay, let's keep going. Jesus responds by telling them the miracles he performs. It's this is why I love uh, like uh, this class is because we break down the verses. If you're reading the Bible, right, you don't recognize what's happening. So John the Baptist sends his disciples to ask if he is the Messiah or not. So imagine this in your head: a group of young people. They're like, "Are you the Messiah?" Right? That's what they want to know. That's the question of the day. Christ responds back by saying, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. Like, like are, are you the Messiah? That's the question. Like, but the blind see, like, do you see what I'm saying? When we read it, we don't recognize you know, the blind see, the deaf hear. But if you understand what is happening, you should pause here and say, wait a second. Like, what is he doing? What is Christ doing? You should really pause and really think about the effect of this. Why is Christ doing this? Is he afraid to answer? Is he yes? Um, I think like when Jesus would talk to like the general public and when he would talk to like the twelve apostles, I think he spoke to them differently. Like he would like speak in parables and like hidden riddles to the general public, and then when he went with the twelve apostles, he would tell them exactly what that means. Because even the twelve apostles would be like confused at confused at times. Yeah, very yeah. good. And then after that, then like once he told the twelve apostles, then they'll spread out like the message. Like, like, right. So these were the disciples of, of John, by the way. Um, and I, I don't have their name. I don't think they were the two who were Christ's apostles as well. I don't have their name. 
Uh, one of us is Steve. Yeah, Steve. Uh, it was, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't this Steve like the first um, martyr? Yeah. Yeah. So it was him? It was him? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, there you go. So, um, but there's something deeper happening. When Christ is speaking this way, there's a reason why he's doing this. What book are we reading right now? Mm-hmm. Matthew. Who's the main audience? Jews. The Jews, right? So it, the Jews are concerned about the prophecies. Remember this. So his his authors are very much aware of the prophecies written about the Messiah. They're aware of this. It just so happens in the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, there's a prophecy about the Messiah. And it says the following. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind, unplug the ears of the deaf, the lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Now it's connected, right? So he's saying, remember that prophecy that's written in the book of Isaiah? The prophecy is coming true, which means, yes, I am the Messiah. We can't understand that because we don't read the book of Isaiah. (laughs) They do, by the way, and we've talked about this before. Back in the day, they don't just read it, they memorize it. Like, it has 66 chapters, by the way. So, like, the breakup of Isaiah is amazing. The first 39 is kind of chastising the nations, and the last 27 is, is kind of embracing them and telling them there's hope, an idea of what's going to happen. Um, 39 Yeah, although that's the Protestant version, but yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 what we need to take away from this is understand this is why we have got to learn that you can't just read it at home and think you're going to understand everything. Right? This is where the Protestants really got it wrong. I don't, I don't mean to bring other people into this, but this is where they got it wrong. Scripture alone cannot be the solution. It just can't be, right? Because you won't never understand what's happening in this verse. Right? You need other things to help you understand the context of what's happening. And that time, they memorized the book of Isaiah. I mean, it was like, no. So when he's saying the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, he's clearly referencing this this uh, verse. So they're like, oh, okay, so if these prophecies are coming true, and yes, they are happening, that means he's truly the Messiah. So he's actually directly answering. It's not even a, a, a parable. He's directly answering them. Right? Let's keep going. So, <clears throat> why is this significant? That the blind see what in the, the deaf hear and all this stuff. Well, there's a, a physical aspect to it, but there's also a spiritual aspect to it. Physically, these people are being healed through miracles, and I think this is obvious. Um, but there's also a spiritual aspect to it, where there's the, the people who are spiritually blind. So what does that mean? Let's talk, let's talk about spiritual aspects. Well, the blind are those who cannot see Christ and what he's doing. These are the Pharisees. They miss the point. How can you cure someone on Saturday, the Sabbath, when you're supposed to be resting? Right? These are the people who miss the point. They miss the target. They, they don't see the most important thing. I'll give, I'll give you guys an example. Uh, no, huh? The no service. Well, no, I was thinking of something even more drastic than that. Um, a few years ago, we were teaching everybody about confession. And then um, in this confession, like a lot of the kids got motivated, right? When we taught them about confession, they were ready to confess. Maybe you guys know about the situation too. And then like, so people got up and started confessing. <laughs> right? Great, amazing. Like, like uh, imagine the angels in heaven, how they're, how they're jumping up and down. Well, <laughs> I, well, I'm not a priest. Not to me, but they started confessing to a priest. They went and talked to priests. Not to, don't tell me confessions. I'll post it on Facebook. <laughs> so, so, so they started like uh, confessing. They told the priest. Uh, they, it was an amazing time. Then I, I got you know uh, called by someone. We're not gonna mention names. Um, and then they said. Uh, why, did, why are kids confessing? <laughs> this is a real conversation. I mean, a bad way or a good way? In a horrible way. Oh. And I'm like, like, what do you mean? <laughs> and, and they said, you didn't, he, he said to me, you didn't notify me that kids were confessing. 
step of like what's supposed to happen. Like you should have notified me and I would have talked to the kids. And the, he's not a priest by the way. And then he was like, I would have took the kids to the priest and then they could have confessed. <laughs> <laughs> Missing the mark. Missing the mark. Do you see what I'm saying? Here we're talking about kids confessing in this day and age. Going to God and saying, God, I've sinned in this day and age. That is the goal. If, if everything that we're doing is not going to take us to the Holy Communion, to confess what we missed, there's no point in us being in here. Nothing. Nothing matters. If our goal in here is not spiritual strength in the sense that we're going to approach Christ and really submit ourselves to Him, there's no point of us being in here. We're just wasting time, right? The whole point of Christianity is to really strengthen our spiritual soul. To confess, to take the Holy Communion, and be in line with what Christ has taught us. This is why He died for our sins. This is it. Not to stand up here and take classes. It's not to go around talking about YOTC and stuff and, and get in a group and take pictures and selfies. That's not the point. That's great. The love is amazing. But the point at the end of the day is to strengthen our spiritual soul, confess, and take Holy Communion. That's why we should all be in here and that's what we should strive to do. If we miss this, we miss the point. We are blind. We are blind. And that is important to understand. And this is the problem with the Pharisees. They don't get it. Christ is there doing service and, and he's helping the people and he's doing all these miracles. If nothing else, enjoy the miracles. Like, wow, that's an amazing thing. Like, wow, how did you do this? If nothing else, don't go in there and then try to create ruckus and all this stuff and, 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 and mess the situation up. So again, spiritual blindness is missing the mark. You don't get it. You don't understand it. If everything that we do is not geared toward that direction, we've missed the mark. Question. Yeah, so like when Jesus was uh, preaching the, that uh, verse in the book of Isaiah to the Jews, like did the Jewish clergymen who memorized it, like did they notice? They notice. They notice. Because next, what we find is they walk away because they receive the answer. And many parts of the Bible, you see in the discussion with Christ, when they don't understand, they, they would say, I don't get it. They would say that. Like for example, in John chapter 6, when he says, unless you eat the flesh of, of, uh, of the blood and the flesh of man and drink his blood, People are like, whoa, like we don't know what you mean. So they stop it. Here they clearly got it because they're walking away. Okay, so I I'm assuming then like there wouldn't be like normal common folk Jews who don't be the... So that's the, the spiritual blindness. Let's talk about the lame. The lame are those that cannot find the motivation to come to Christ. These are the people who set goals there. They know like, all right, this year is the year I'm going to confess, right? But something always comes up and kind of holds them back so they're unable to to set the goals that they they uh, complete the goals that they have in store for them um these are the names let's keep going we're going to talk about the solution later uh those who have leprosy are those whose souls are infected by the world of sin to the point that their true nature is altered you know leprosy is like your your skin is changing right your natural skin is changing i want to talk a little bit about this because this is a real problem like we think that uh, we do have like a, a tendency to do bad, but this is a learned behavior. It's not something like we were born with perfection in the image of God, right? That, that's really how we are. But through time, we learn these bad behavior. I don't care what, like think about the sin that you're struggling with, right? Because everybody is, right, David? Everybody's struggling. <laughs> Everybody's struggling with sin. You want to tell us what you were saying? No. Rosie, you want to? No. <laughs> no, we know what you just said. How's work? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to come here? <laughs> so, 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 um, so everybody's struggling with sin. Think about what your sin is and you think for yourself, like, why is this so hard for me to stop doing this? I'm not denying that. Yes, it's hard to stop. But remember, it is a learned trait. It's not something you were born liking. Um, I wrote in here, you know, Hitler, for example, when he was two, he was probably a cute baby, you know what I mean, like, he was just a goo goo ga ga like everybody else in German, um, I don't know how that would sound like, but you know, he was like a cute baby, like, you probably would have picked him up, you know what I mean, like, he wouldn't be like, mm, you know what I mean, <laughs> like, you know, he was, he was adorable, so like, he had to learn, and, and really train his mind to hate. This was a, a learned behavior. 
Or was it something like he was just like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it, that didn't happen. And it's funny because I remember, I actually remember the time, the I don't remember the exact date, but I remember the period when I began to curse. I actually remember that. It was in middle school. When I got in there, I was like, I think I should curse. <laughs> I remember this. I was like, you know, I think it's about time. <laughs> so, so I had to practice because, like, my grammar and, 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 and cursing was just off. You know what I mean? So I had to practice, like, you know, what the fun are you doing with it and all this stuff. And, 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 like, I had to practice at home with my brother. Like, what is this? And what is that? You know? And then I remember when I, you know, I had to say, like, I was like, okay, I grew up and whatever, and then I had to stop cursing. It was really bad. I couldn't stop. And whenever you get mad, like, I remember one time my mom was, like, uh, in the car with me, and I'm driving, and we were about to get in a car accident, and I stopped. I said, what the F? And she was like, I didn't come back. I'm like, oops. <laughs> so, it, it was natural, but I didn't even think about that, right? It wasn't, like, something, like, I was thinking about, okay, this is the right time to curse. <laughs> but this was, like, it got to the point where my, my, my soul was corrupted, and my mind was corrupted to the point where it became natural. Something I had to learn at first, which was difficult at first, became so natural that I don't even think about it. So these things in every part of your life, remember, because it's a learned behavior, you can always unlearn it. It takes time, it is difficult, it is very, very tough, it is annoying at times. I don't care what that problem is. Um, understand that you've learned that behavior and you can always unlearn it. Um, but again, uh, there's ways to do that, and then we're going to talk about the solution later. So when it's talking about leprosy, it's talking about like people whose nature has just changed, and just think about the way you think. Even I know, like uh, I had this thing, like man, in school we used to, uh, in the mall we used to stand around and make fun of people. You know what I mean? Like it was just a thing we, we did, like when people walk by, all right, all right, your turn. I don't have the best style, you know, and then other stuff as well. So, so like, people would like, and it, so because I was in that mindset, like, a lot of the times, like, I thought, like, when I saw people, I would see their faults, naturally. And that wasn't, that's not okay. Like, even when I came to the church, I had a really difficult time with this. This is not good, you know? And you have to unlearn that behavior and really see that, like, the beauty of people and stuff like that. So, whatever it is, whether it's a mindset, people are... Uh, by nature angry or like stubborn. I don't know many people like that. <laughs> all learned behaviors. All learned behaviors, right? So you can unlearn this and really get into a new mindset. Take it, like, challenge yourself. Really challenge yourself, especially if there's a particular area where you know that's your weakness. Challenge yourself and believe that you can really change it and that by leaning on God and, 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 and being open-minded. Okay, let's go to the next one. Being deaf. This is the one uh, I really like, and I and I, and I mean like uh, uh, deaf, not totally, but like partially being deaf to the church. And what I mean by this is what I was alluding to earlier. <clears throat> many people are not ready to, to give up God altogether, but many people are also not ready to fully accept Him. So what we do naturally is to accept parts of Him, right? So the love we take. The forgiveness we take, the fact that he is a just God, and the fact that he rules and, and, and really, you know, um, is any a selfish God, we tend to forget. We don't want to think about these things, right? So uh, the fact that God said he is love, but he will forgive us as we forgive those who came against us. So we tend to forget that part, right? We like forgive us as we forgive. Right? So, but, like, we are only forgiven as much as we forgive those who hurt us, our hate, like, the people that we hate, the, well, not that we hate, but the people who have done, like, wrong things to us. Right? Our ability to be forgiven is when we forgive those. We tend to, like, not listen to that part, but we ask forgiveness every day. Right? So we are partially deaf to certain aspects of the church. We're not ready to completely get rid of them. But there are parts of them that we just don't like. Many times we tend to be deaf in partiality. 
Okay, that's what you serve by Allah being accepted, but others who don't accept. And the dead, of course, are those who live a life outside of uh, Christianity. Where's my phone? <laughs> so, um, and of course, the dead are those who live their life as if God does not exist. Uh, so, the point is, he says that these people are cured. Which means there is a medicine for this. There is a way for them to be healed. So there is no point of us thinking, like if we if we find ourselves struggling with one of these uh, problems, we shouldn't think of ourselves. That's it. We're doomed. This is it. Like that's it. No, we're cured. So there's there's medicine. What is the medicine? Well, it's, it says that the cure of medicine is teaching, learning, right? In one, in each and every single one of these situations. Learning either by God teaching you or by you opening up your mind, coming to the church and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you through whatever mechanism, whether the Bible, whether teachers, whether deacons, whether whatever it is, right? So there's mechanisms to help you really grow and change this type of uh, problems that we're struggling with. There's, there's medicine for this. So that's our hope is to understand that whether we're struggling in whatever area of our life, understand that there's hope. We just have to claim this medicine. That's already given to us. It's already given to us. We just have to claim it. Let's keep going. Uh, and then he says, uh, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. Now, this is very confusing again if you think about the verse. Why would someone fall away because of God? Because of Christ? It doesn't make any sense. Right? But they're being persecuted because in his name, maybe? Right. So, what this is talking about is, he, like those who recognize my true nature, right? So people who fall because of Christ there are people who can't recognize who he is. People who say, for example, he is just man, right? Not recognizing his divinity. Who question his power. Who question his authority. Who question his love. That's a problem. You guys know that, right? When we confess, we have to really believe Christ has forgiven us. That's like a problem, especially for like, you know, the first time you confess. And then like, you know, the priest tells you, you've been forgiven. Like, really? You know, like, but I really did a lot of stuff wrong. Like, but this is how big Christ is. But, but really? You know, and then like, you feel kind of guilty. Like, this is the problem that a lot of people have when they first confess. But we have to understand how big Christ is. He's bigger than our sin. Right? So he will forgive us. And then it's also important to understand how... Remorseful we have to be. God is not a friend. Where we're like, hey God, I got a funny story to tell you. That, you know, the other day I was out with some friends and uh, we grabbed some beers and got drunk. You know, like, this is not the time to talk to God like he's your buddy where you could just tell him whatever you want, right? So we have to also understand who he is. Be remorseful, understand that you're appearing before the king of all kings, the lord of all lords. So there has to be a sense of fear when we approach him. So understand who he is, and people fall because of him means they don't recognize who he is. They don't understand his nature. They don't understand how big he is. They don't understand how forgiving he is. And they don't understand that he does um, rule justly. Um, let me stop here and see if you guys have any questions. Point once, point twice. Yes, ma'am. You know, he said in our prayer, we always ask uh, God to forgive us and we forgive others. Yes. When we say when we go to confess, we're forgiven. Are we forgiven to the same extent that we forgive those that have wronged us? Or are we actually forgiven? Well, so that's that should be part of your confession, right? So your confession is whatever you confess. Well, if you're not forgiving your, those who've done wrong things to you, you're not confessing that, then that's not a true confession. Right? A true confession says, you know, somebody did wrong to me and I didn't forgive them. So that's part of your confession. And then you work out, you know, with your priest after that what happens. So is it considered forgiveness if you do like, forgive them? You just have no desire to have a relationship with them? Well, the specifics, I, I would say, talk to your confession father about it. Who is it, by the way? No, I'm kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but, but the specifics, uh, you know, talk to your confession father. Because every situation is different, right? Every situation is different. Was it last? Where was it that we were talking about um, not being uh, peaceful? What it what it meant to not be peaceful? 
right? So like, if there's people who are doing wrong things, we can't be peace in peace with them. We have to kind of part away. The Bible says, if you can, get along with everybody else. Why do you say that? If you can. There's some folks we can't stand. All right? <laughs> there, I mean, and this one there is six billion people. We, we expected to love everybody. But we can't just like hang around with everybody and just like 24 people. It's, it's impossible. There's natures that are not going to get along with it. But recognize that. Give them love. Right? But, and then there's a difference between doing that and then saying, like, I've got to be, like, I've got to see you every single day, regardless of what, you know what I mean? Specific stuff, stick with your, you know, stick with your, I thought you were going to say something, I thought you were going to be like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, no, I, uh, is this an answer? Okay. No, it's, it's, it's just literally mention one of some of the teachings that Christ teach that a little known is this the one I was just putting it out in Mark chapter 11 verse 25 it says when you stand on prayer so that your heavenly father will forgive you just forgive anyone that wrong did to you so um, I know it's really really hard but uh, that's that's how uh, Christ mentioned it yeah I just had a question like, um, like when you confess like you said that if you, didn't, if you don't confess like a certain sin, then that's not going to be the one forgiven because you didn't confess that one. How do you have confessed, Father? Because I don't want to get into that aspect without my authority, right? Okay. So uh, I don't like to answer questions like that. But if you are going to confess, talk to my boss, how about it? Um, no. <laughs> All right. Okay. So then. So clearly, like I was saying earlier, they get the answer. They get the full answer. So now the disciples, they're like, great. Like, we got the answer. They start walking away. They're about to leave. Christ says, let me tell you how awesome John is. Why? Again, like when you're reading it, imagine it in your head as like try to play it like a movie, right? Like imagine it in your head. Like, how does that make sense? So here. The disciples are here to ask whether or not, you know, Christ is the Messiah. Christ is not offended. He answers them. And then as they're leaving, they're like, oh, by the way, John is amazing. John is great. He's the greatest. Why wait until they leave to start talking about John? Right? But that's the question that we're going to try to answer. What's the problem? Hmm? What's the problem? You get praising John? Talking about John. Praising John. Anything. Something with John. Number one, Christ wanted to show that this question is coming from the disciples and not from John. So he wanted Christ, Christ wanted the public to know that it's not John that's doubting who Christ is. It's, it's his disciples. And he wanted to show them like a uh, like this is, you know, like this is not really uh, John doubting, but this is like other people questioning. That's why they're coming to me. So he's kind of exemplifying John. One, two. Notice how Christ is like still supporting John. Like if this was a ministry, like there are people around, whatever, right? And it's like coming here and saying, uh, like, if somebody said to me. You don't have the qualifications to teach, right? In, in public, I'm not gonna be like blind to see the deaf here. I'm not gonna do that. I'm be like, who are you? Like, what qualifications do you have to judge? I'm gonna get real offended, right? And if, if, if I was told like David, David's students are the ones who are asking me this, I'm gonna be like, you know, David, he knows nothing. You know, and I'm gonna like do a lot of things. Notice what Christ is doing here. This is, the, I think, a huge lesson if we really like look at it. Number one, in public, he's supporting the main cause, which is still a, a, a spiritual calling, right? Christ, it's, it's about Christ, right? And then John is still kind of pointing his finger at Christ, and Christ himself is himself. Um, so he's, for the sake of the gospel, he's not playing this game of, like, I'm bigger than him, or, like, listen to me, don't worry about John, right? For the sake of the gospel, and so that the people are not, like, confused and, like, 
worried about what's happening if there's a division between John or, or Christ. He's telling them, actually, you know, John is amazing. You know, so he's bringing that like everybody together. He's unifying the people. This is a great opportunity for Christ to say, you know, I'm greater than John. Like I created the world. I did this. He could have said that and created this division, this group of like the group of John and the group of Christ. But notice how he unifies. And I think this is a huge lesson for all of us and how we should deal with like questions like this, right? So it's an op every opportunity is an opportunity to unif unify instead of divide. So I think that's a, a, a very, very important thing. Second, he didn't want John to know the great things that he's saying about him. Seems weird, right? Like, why not? Here's the thing. If you guys, like, after every single class, and you like, hey, that was an amazing lesson, that was an amazing lesson, I'm going to be like, I'm a pretty good teacher. I do pretty, I'm okay. Like, I, you know, I'm doing pretty awesome, right? The minute I'm doing that, I forget that the, this is about Christ, and I start thinking this is about me. Right? This is number, I mean, we learn this about service class all the time. This is a huge problem. I remember one time, was it Minnesota or something like that? Like, I gave a sermon about, like, please don't say, like, I did a good job. And it was about, like, recognizing that all the, like, glory goes to, to God and all this stuff. Nobody said anything to me, and I was like, man, was that good or not? Like, <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't know how to touch this. You know? It really affects you. If you're a human being, it affects you. Like, whatever you do, you want to know, like, how people thought about it. Like, the reviews. Like, I still go on YouTube every single day, the auto course, how many hits. You know? Like, the glory of God has to go to God. Not to ourselves. And we're here to serve God, not ourselves. Right? And here's the thing. Don't ever say you serve for free. But God be shut Right? Don't ever say we do this for free because we are being paid fully in heaven. Like fully. Whenever people start praising you here in this world, that means you're taking away what you're going to be paid in heaven and you got the reward here so there's nothing for you to receive. Nothing. You go up there and like, okay, where's my benefit? You took it all. You have it in this world. God was going to say, great job. But you received it in this world. There's nothing for you to receive anymore. You see? So, give the glory to God. If you touch the glory, the power will go away. Somebody said to me just two days ago. Yeah, sorry. Two days. Doesn't matter. They said that to me. If you touch the glory, the power will go away. The glory is God's. Don't touch the glory because God will take away the power. And that power is given to us by God, so we have to recognize God. Um, okay. Then he starts talking about the, the reed, and he's saying, like, uh, what did you expect to see? Like, reed being swayed by breath of wind symbolizes. So he talks about the reed. Now, the reed being swayed back and forth, right? So he's like, is that what you expect to see? So the important thing to note here is that uh, the reed is symbolizing somebody who's not, like, strong in their faith. There's a lot of people like that. Like, uh, you talk to them today about, like, one aspect of like uh, Christianity or, or church or whatever, they're like, I fully believe that, I'm gonna do this today, right now, I'm becoming a monk. You know, like, and then the next day they, they learn about like another theory or philosophy, whatever, and it's like, that's it, I'm opening up a bar, a club, but you know, like, they're, you don't know where they are. It's important, regardless of like how you feel about a certain issue, take time, even in Christianity, like, take slow steps. It's, it's better to be grounded rather than run and not grasp anything. That's that's a huge problem, especially, like, a new Christian is bigger than a bishop. Meaning, like, when people first come to the church, they think, like, I could do, like, that's it. You know, like, <laughs> like the only seven fast, I'll do 17. You know, like, <laughs> and then, you know what I mean? Like, and, and then people will start, like, but, like, it's not going to last. Don't start something that you're not, you're not going to finish. And you might be able to do it one, two, two days. You will break down, right? And then it's important to understand that. So when you get all this, like, energy to do something, take that energy, but, like, use it slowly and grow slowly. Build yourself slowly, you know? This is not, like, a race just to, to, to go forward. Um, and then at the same time, when you're growing slowly, don't be so fast to kind of go around and then... And, and then uh, believe something that opposed your faith to, to begin with. So that's also important to understand. Then, of course, Matthew, 
um, uh, references uh, uh, a gospel, um, and then he says, uh, uh, he references Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare you before my, uh, uh, he will prepare your way before you. So here, the reason why I'm quoting this is, notice Matthew's again, his audience is, the Jews, so when he's talking about uh, John, it was uh, only appropriate to reference the prophecies that were in the Old Testament. Um, and uh, these are kind of like the trends of Matthew. They're still your, um, your reflections. Um, are you guys still doing your reflections? Really? Are you guys doing your reflections? Yes. This is not encouraging. This is not encouraging. Are you guys doing your reflections? Yes. yes. No, I'm saying there are no reflections. Do your reflections. Yeah, I'm finished. Yeah, I'm finished. Day five. Yeah. And it's over half of it. Are you doing this? We haven't finished, guys. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about? I skipped the page. He's trying to test us. Well, we finished, actually. No. Page, page, oh, I'm half of it. it. Did I forget that in a moment? What's going on? Oh, that's for next week. Yeah, that's for yeah, our document was longer. So, no wonder why. I was like, there's something was happening. So, so this is what happened. I was, I was doing this yesterday, and I was like, wow, this is a lot of stuff. So, we're going to look at this next week, actually. Um, I cut it out on mine. I thought I cut it. I don't know where it's wrong. So where does, where does it end for you? Um, Malachi 3-1? Yeah. You were going to test it? I would. Yeah, I'll see this. So the last one is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, because people got places to go. No. I'm like, what's happening? Why is everybody looking at me? <laughs> is that a question? <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Is that a question? Yeah. yeah. So, why does the disciples of John the Baptist do why, why were they down? Huh? Why were they doubting? Why are they doubting? Yeah, because their master or their teacher is delivering the Christ, but why are they doubting? I want to answer that question. I'm not I'm not being funny on the You said the answer earlier. You saw I turn off the camera. <laughs>